Once the sperm enters the egg, let's say it does so down here, the fertilizing sperm might have entered quite some distance away from the female pronucleus. And in echinoderms, that distance might be on the order of 100 microns or so, even larger for some other eggs. They have to find each other to fuse to make the zygote nucleus. The first sign of the process by which the sperm recruits and migrates to the female pronucleus is the outgrowth, the appearance in the cytoplasm of faint radiating lines around the site of the sperm nucleus. This so-called sperm aster represents the growth of long microtubules that reach out from a microtubule organizing center derived from the sperm's basal body. And this gives us the opportunity to introduce the cell's other great filament system, the microtubules. When we talked about the acrosome reaction, we discussed actin, the ATPase that assembles spontaneously into microfilaments and tends to associate with membranes and do all kinds of things like that. Now we're going to talk about tubulin, another polymer forming protein. Tubulin actually comes as a dimer of the related but different alpha and beta subunits. Like actin, tubulin binds a, GT, uh, a nucleotide, but in this case, it's a GTP, not an ATP. Like actin, tubulin hydrolyzes its bound nucleotide, but does so poorly, at least as a, a dimer floating around in the cytoplasm. As it turns out, it hydrolyzes its nucleotide when it's assembled into a microtubule, into the lattice of a growing microtubule. Now, tubulin, of course, to polymerize, it must mean that it's joined by other tubulin dimers. And in fact, this must repeat over and over again to create a polymer, as with actin. The tubulin dimer has the propensity not only to associate with other tubulins head to tail, but also side to side. And that gives rise, if they all stick together long enough, that is, to a rectanguloid lattice. Of course, if you were making this out of Legos, you could actually assemble a two-dimensional sheet like I've drawn. Tubulins are not perfectly rectangular little bricks, although the lattice tends to be pretty straight in this axis, that is, in the axis of the tubulin dimers, it has a curve this way, which means that as this lattice grows, if enough tubulins stick together long enough, that is, it rolls itself into a tube, like so. Now what I'm drawing here is one growth axis, one of these protofilaments. And I'll draw the one right next to it too. Now, I hope you don't uh, expect me to count in my drawing uh, too accurately. Uh, I'm going to uh, just say there are 13 protofilaments in a standard microtubule. And as this lattice grows, 
it is initially splayed out, but zippers itself up along this midline between these two that I drew initially. This is a very large object compared to an actin filament. Unlike actin, tubulin assembles into great big stiff rods, and they can be very long. Uh, but like actin, tubulin assembles spontaneously. It makes polar polymers. There's a difference between this end and this one. And uh, as I mentioned, it uh, hydrolyzes its nucleotide. You'll notice I've only drawn in some of the uh, GTPs on here. First of all, only one of them matters because only one of them can be exchanged for a fresh one. The, the other one actually is never hydrolyzed. And as tubulin dimers add to this lattice, the, nuclei, nucle, the bound nucleotide tends to be hydrolyzed shortly thereafter. Nucleotide hydrolysis profoundly affects microtubule stability because while the GTP bound form of tubulin makes a nice straight protofilament. The GDP bound form of tubulin makes a curved protofilament. The GTP bound tubulin lattice is indefinitely stable. In fact, if you force microtubules to assemble from tubulin that's bound to a non hydrolyzable version of GTP, they'll sit there for quite a long time. You can do all kinds of things with them in, in vitro. But the lattice is unstable if they're all bound to GDP. This is a growing microtubule. People can see these things with careful electron microscopy techniques. But a shrinking microtubule looks something like this. All those bonds holding things together, sprung apart. All the protofilaments curl outward and little bits of protofilament break off. Again, people can see this configuration with careful electron microscopy techniques. This kind of ram's horn look represents a shrinking microtubule And the story goes something like this. GTP tubulin binds to the growing tip of a microtubule. And at some time thereafter, it hydrolyzes its GTP. But the lattice will be stable as long as there remains a cap of GTP bound tubulin. Imagine a fuse of GTP hydrolysis burning behind the growing tip. If hydrolysis catches up to the growing tip so that the tip becomes GDP bound, then the tip is no longer stabilized against the conformational change that would splay all those protofilaments out and cause the microtubule lattice to fall apart. This abrupt transition between distinct growing and shrinking states at the so-called plus end, the growing end of the microtubule, gives rise to characteristic lifetimes. If you watch microtubules over time, I'm going to draw a few of them now in, in a few lifetimes in different colored chalks. So this over here is length over time, microtubules tend to grow at a steady rate, but then they might abruptly switch to shrinking, whereupon they'll shrink at a steady rate. But they might abruptly resume growth. Or of course, they might collapse all the way down. Oops, that one resumed growth after all. Not all microtubules live very long. This one grew for a little bit, 
and abruptly underwent a catastrophe. That's what we call this transition. This here is a catastrophe, at least for that individual microtubule. But a microtubule, once it undergoes catastrophe, might also experience rescue. and proceed to grow for a very long time, perhaps. That's what these events are. This phenomenon called dynamic instability, in which steady growth and shrinkage phases are punctuated by catastrophe and rescue is based on the balance between addition of subunits at the growing tips and the fuse of GTP hydrolysis burning behind those growing tips. And it's exploited by cells to do search and capture in the following way. Let's take a look at this blown up now. In most cells, most of the time, microtubule nucleation is concentrated at so-called microtubule organizing centers, or MTOC for short. We'll use that term a lot. Uh, the best known of which is based upon the centriole, which in a ciliated cell behaves as the basal body it templates the growth of the axoneme in uh, both ciliated cells and also other cells. The centriole, we call it a centriole when it's behaving as the uh, hub for a so-called centrosome. Which is the principal microtubule organizing center at work here and, and in most animal cells most of the time. Let's not confuse these two words. The centrosome is based around the centriole which is a little structural thing that you can actually see in the electron microscope it itself is made of tubulin and its microtubules in a special configuration. Um, and around the centriole recruits a bunch of fluff, really unstructured fluff in the electron microscope. Uh, people identified this long ago and simply gave it the very revealing name, the pericentriolar material, or PCM. And it happens to be one of the things that's concentrated in this pericentriolar material is the nucleation factors for microtubules. Of course, in this context, that is associated with the male pronucleus, which has just entered the egg, and within this paracentriol, paracentriolar material are the nucleation events that initiate growth of individual microtubules. And they grow out from it in all directions. Some of them grow a long way, some of them don't. That's the idea of dynamic instability. They search the cytoplasm by growing in all directions, and perhaps one of them will grow long enough to find something interesting. Perhaps even the female pronucleus all the way over here. <laughs> 
these microtubules growing out from the centrosome. They're nucleated in here. That's where they started. All their minus ends where very little, if any, tubulin addition takes place. I should make those a distinct color. All their minus ends are back here. I won't draw them all in, but all their plus ends are out here. These are the ends that we're watching when we draw diagrams like these. And that's the picture of a growing versus a shrinking plus end. Okay, so um, here's the thing. Again, this distance might be very large. And there might be a lot of tubulin in the cell, but how much tubulin does it take to span this distance? All right, so I haven't drawn this perfectly to scale, but let's say this is 10 microns. So these things are, I don't know, 30 or 50 microns away from each other. Uh, not exactly on opposite sides of the egg, but still. How many tubulins? Let's, by way of preamble, say it actually takes only one microtubule to reach from the centrosome associated with the sperm nucleus to the female pronucleus in order to connect them constructively. That's sufficient for them to find each other, okay? So each of these things is uh, eight nanometers long, the tubulin dimer that is. So that means you have to stack up 125 of them tubulins per per micron of protofilament. And there are 13 protofilaments in this microtubule, right? So that means it's 1600 tubulin dimers per micron of microtubule. That's a lot. So 16,000 to get across 10 microns. It means to get from here to here means requires something like uh, 80,000 dimers to assemble for a typical distance that these things need to cross. But that's not all, because the sperm has no idea where the female pronucleus is, and she is not known to be emitting any particular kind of microtubule attractant as it happens. So the female pronucleus is, as it happens, roughly a five or a 10 micron sphere, uh, which means, let's say, an 80 square micron circular target if we're looking at it from the point of view of the sperm nucleus trying to aim something in that hole, right? And the sperm aster might have to search a spherical volume in this egg. The sperm aster might have to search a spherical volume with a radius of about 50 microns. So let's think about this surface area of this 50 micron sphere. Well, uh, the surface area of that sphere works out to about 30,000 square microns. So if we say this is an 80 square micron hole out of a 30,000 square micron search area, that's about means one four hundredth of a chance that any one microtubule emitted by the sperm aster, emitted from the sperm centrosome, is going to be aimed in the right direction to contact the female pronucleus. So to exhaustively search, the point of this exercise is to say, 
to exhaustively search the egg with, by just randomly assembling microtubules in all directions. First of all, if you have to assume that mistakes will be made, that the first microtubule you build is not going to be the lucky one, it turns out that to exhaustively search that kind of diameter would require on the order of 32 million dimers to assemble. And if you imagine that you can make perhaps a few hundred of these things at a time, maybe a thousand, then it's guaranteed that this process by which they find each other is going to take minutes. Of course, the search is not actually exhaustive, thanks to dynamic instability, nor is it entirely symmetric. But the simple calculation nevertheless illustrates the magnitude of the reactions required simply for these parts of the cell to find each other in a, in a realistic time scale. What if you wanted to make a bigger egg? What would you do? Would you just wait longer? Would you redesign it somehow? What would happen? Over here, I've redrawn the same picture of the pronucleus, the sperm pronucleus capturing the egg pronucleus without um, some of the clutter to explain what happens next. But before I do that, I wanna say a few words about the green thing here, the centrioles, what they are. Well, it's not entirely clear where they came from. It is pretty clear that the last common ancestor of all living eukaryotes had one and that it functioned in those cells as it does in our cells today as the template for the growth of the skeleton of the cilium, the microtubules that form the axoneme. And that it also served as the hub for a microtubule organizing center in the cytoplasm. Some groups have lost it red algae and most fungi no longer have centrioles. Centrioles consist of nine compound microtubules. The nine green sticks that I'm drawing in here, each one of those sticks is, a, is, a, is three microtubules lashed tightly together, actually sharing a wall. And there's some other things holding it together too. There must be something about it that recruits the paracentriole or material and so on. Centrioles come in pairs, at least in the cells that we're talking about at the moment. There is a mother and a daughter. This daughter centriole here is closely associated. It's not directly templated from the mother. I can't tell you how the cell knows how to make these things, and I'm not sure anyone else can tell you how either. But at any rate, the daughter centriole always appears at a 90 degree angle like that with the mother centriole. And eventually the mother and daughter might separate. The daughter has to be licensed in order to replicate herself and to serve as the hub for a microtubule organizing center. We'll come back to this subject a little bit later when we talk about uh, oocyte meiosis. At any rate, as I said, just one microtubule reaching from the sperm centrosome to the female pronucleus is sufficient to capture her. What's going on with this lucky microtubule? Let's look at a little blow up down here. It turns out to be a universal, almost universal trait of the nuclear envelope that it is decorated with a microtubule motor, dynein. So first I'm just going to draw that microtubule as a big long spaghetti like that. Again, its plus end is pointed out extending further into the cytoplasm, but it's just captured the, or come within striking distance of, oh, that's terrible curvature. The nucleus is much, much bigger than the microtubule, isn't it? Let me get that right. The curvature is gonna be more like 
you know, on this scale, if at all, okay? It's just come within striking distance of the nuclear membrane of the female pronucleus. And on the surface of the female pronucleus is a giant protein that consists of a sort of a gang of wheels connected to a pair of feet. This is the motor protein dynine. And if dynein gets a hold of a microtubule, it will walk along it. This should remind you of what I said about myosin walking along actin filaments. Dynein also cares about the polarity of the microtubule. Dynein walks towards the minus N. That is, if it engages with this microtubule, it's going to tend to walk that way. And that's exactly what happens. Motor proteins on the nuclear envelope Dynein, by the way, has this weird sort of shuffling gait. One foot sort of takes a big step and then the other one shuffles behind. Anyway, motor proteins decorating the nuclear envelope latch on and start to walk the female pronucleus back toward the centrosome, the microtubule organizing center from which this microtubule grew. So if we come back a little while later here, I'm just going to draw another female pronucleus that's getting, uh, let's presume several dynenes have engaged at this point. And in fact, so if this is T equals zero, this is uh, now T equals something later, T1. <laughs> um, There might be very many dynenes engaged at this point walking it along, and uh, the female pronucleus actually be becomes deformed often into a teardrop shape as it's moving along this track. Eventually, it might engage with several microtubules on its way in. So this is now, uh, whatever, time point two, at which things at which point things uh, are certain to be consummated. That's uh, going to make it all the way. Again, this is a nearly universal trait of nuclear membranes that they recruit uh, dynein. So do many other structures in the cell, for example, the cell cortex. Now I want to preview one of the papers that's assigned for the first set of readings by uh, Hiramoto, uh, which uh, describes pronuclear migration and its microtubule dependence and does some very clever experiments to show how this process works. In particular, uh, I want to explain their use, their creative use of microtubule poisons. There are many microtubule poisons out there. Of course, cells have been trying to kill each other in creative ways as long as cells have uh, been around. And one of, the, one of the ways that they've thought of is to poison the cytoskeleton. Um, a very commonly used microtubule poison, colsamid, turns out to be sensitive to ultraviolet light. So if you add colsamid to cells, all the microtubules will fall apart except for very stable or stabilized ones, such as the microtubules of the axoneme, as it turns out. You could wash the colsamid away and perhaps the microtubules would recover, but it turns out you can also shine ultraviolet light on them, which will destroy the colsamid. It converts it to a, a neutral form that doesn't affect microtubules, and microtubules will regrow. So what they do in this paper is to use ultraviolet illumination of sand dollar eggs bathed in this microtubule poison to allow microtubule assembly at certain times or in certain places as they wish in order to explore which microtubules are actually required for pronuclear migration to succeed, where and when do they have to grow.
Okay, so once they meet, once the pronuclei meet, they have a happy union and uh, all is well. Uh, they have to find their way to the center of the egg, as it turns out, um, where they will set up um, housekeeping for the very brief life of the zygote, the centrosome as a microtubule organizing center, and the propensity of microtubules to exhibit dynamic instability, combined with the fact that this motor, dynein, is also associated with the cell surface, provides the cell with a way to find its own center. And here is roughly how. First of all, when microtubules slow down their assembly for any reason, they're likely to undergo catastrophe. Again, catas the frequency of catastrophe is largely a function of how fast subunits are adding to the growing microtubule tip compared to the burning of this fuse of GTP hydrolysis behind the growing tip. So when microtubules are just growing freely in an ocean of available tubulin in, say, a great big egg, there's tubulin dimers adding rapidly, and they're all GTP bound, of course, and perhaps the fuse hasn't burned all the way to the tip, so they'll keep growing. But sooner or later, something might happen. For example, this microtubule might run into the cell surface or the plasma membrane, some sort of barrier, at which point perhaps it becomes more difficult for monomers, for, excuse me, for tubulin dimers to add to this growing tip at quite the rate they were doing before. And it is therefore not surprising that frequently when one watches live microtubules in cells or even in little cuvettes in vitro, they tend to undergo catastrophe when they run into a barrier. So the microtubule grows and grows and grows. It encounters something that limits the rate of, mo of addition of new tubulins and then it undergoes catastrophe. Now, of course, if it so happened that they grew along the wall, let me draw that uh, slightly more conveniently here. Let's say they have a glancing encounter with the wall to make it a little more intuitive. Perhaps that doesn't provide as much of a barrier to new addition and they can keep growing. perhaps even growing along the wall for a little while. However, dining engagement with an end It's going to give it a pull. All right, so let's imagine now that we have our barrier and a microtubule happily growing along toward it. And waiting for it are some dining motors that are eager to walk towards the minus end of that growing microtubule. So eventually, they're going to get a hold of it and they're going to pull that way. They're going to give it a yank, 
right into the barrier, which is going to limit addition of new tubulins so that, again, the microtubule might undergo catastrophe right out from under them. Nevertheless, perhaps while they were engaged, these dynein motors managed to give that microtubule a little tug, pulling along whatever it's attached to back at its minus end. Okay. Furthermore, dynein engagement actually tends to make rescue more likely. As long as these motors are engaged with the microtubule, it might go on, uh, it might remain stable enough for them to walk a little ways before undergoing catastrophe and falling apart, or it might even resume growth. If you combine these various effects of microtubule dynamic instability and the propensity of dynein to both pull on microtubules while stimulating a catastrophe, then a demonstrable consequence is that if you put a microtubule organizing center in a box and the box is lined with dynein, you'll emit microtubules everywhere. Those microtubules might say, grow out to the walls, they might skid along them ways though if there's enough tubulin around and they can grow far enough to reach the far wall, then the sum of all of these uh, interactions means this thing will wander around with the random pulls and tugs. But of course, the place where all of them will come to equilibrium is in the center of the box. Hence, dynamic instability combined with cytoplasmic dynein provides a means by which the cell can find its own center. And that's thought to be how the pronuclei get themselves to the center of the cell in preparation for mitosis.